Whitehall, one, two, one, two. Hurry. This is Scotland Yard. For the first time, Scotland Yard opens its secret files to bring you the authentic, true stories of some of its most baffling cases. These records are drawn from the Scotland Yard files, and only the names of the participants have been changed. The research has been prepared by Mr. Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter for the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Mr. Willis Cooper. Here are the principal participants in Scotland Yard case number 397-MR381. Stanley Russell, shop clerk. Mr. Russell is not to be found. Mrs. Hope Russell, his wife. Mrs. Russell was reported missing on the day before Good Friday. Adolf Hitler's Luftwaffe. Chief Inspector Bryce Purcell of Scotland Yard. I should like to introduce Deputy Commander William Byrd of Scotland Yard, my superior officer. Before we proceed, I believe it would be a good idea to visit the Black Museum. Come along with me, if you please. After you, sir. Good afternoon, John. Good afternoon, sir. This is Chief Superintendent John Davidson, curator of Scotland Yard's Black Museum. Well, how do you do? You came about case number 397-MR381, I believe you said, sir. Right. Will you tell us about it, John? Well, this is the exhibit. No, don't touch it, please. It's quite fragile. And as you can see, it has already been broken. We have a great many other exhibits of crimes in these rooms. Murder weapons, blood-stained garments, bullets that have snuffed out many lives, death masks of many notorious criminals. Almost every um, instrument of violence that can be conceived. I should explain that these gruesome objects about us are not merely souvenirs. Many of them have aided our men in solving other crimes and bringing the perpetrators to justice. Now, this one... Tell us what this thing is, John. This is Mrs. Hope Russell. Sixteen months after the Easter Blitz of 1941, the work of clearing out bombed-out areas of London was still progressing... On the 12th July 1942, the Scotland Yard Information Room received an urgent call from P.C. John Dunn of the Kennington District. A patrol car in which Chief Inspector Purcell was riding was dispatched to the scene, a partially destroyed Baptist chapel. I was directed to the spot by P.C. Dunn, who was on point duty at the road intersection. Right over there, sir, where you see the men standing. They found some it, sir. The navvies that's working here. Right, thank you. Morning, boys. Morning. What have you found? Who are you, mate? I'm Chief Inspector Purcell, Scotland Yard. What's up? Down, sir. Down there. In that hole, sir. Yeah. It's an old burying wall, sir. But what is it? A skeleton, sir. He's dead. Up down, Georgie and Sean, with your torch. All right. There you see, sir. Here he is. Stand to one side, will you? He's off under this stone slab, sir. Don't see? I see him. Well, what's so strange about a skeleton in a burial vault? There ain't been anybody in there since 1934, sir. 1935. Uh, I was in that gang that moved the old corpses out of here, Herbert. It was 1934. We didn't leave a one. God bless you. It's the quicklime down here, sir. Quicklime? How'd, how'd quicklime get down there? You're the detective, mister. We just work here. The badly burned skeleton was removed to the pathological laboratories at Scotland Yard, together with the other articles found in the vault. A considerable amount of quicklime and a half-burned straw pellius which had partially covered the remains. There was nothing else. 
I stood beside Keith Briggs, the home office pathologist, while he completed his examination. What do you think, Keith? I asked. Well, she's dead. She? Oh, it's a woman, all right. No question about that. The hip bones are characteristically a woman's. So is the sacrum here, and... Uh... Uh, how old a woman? Oh, middle-aged, I'd say. The bones are fully developed, mm -hmm. so we know she was full-grown. And there were one or two strands of long gray hair adhering to the skull. Here they are. And then the teeth here. What about them? Well, you see, they're pretty well worn. Now, you see here, in the upper jaw, mm -hmm. seven of the uppers are missing. Now... See these ridges? Yes. Well, they were caused by a dental plate, which probably consisted of seven teeth, and then... Uh, what are you looking for? The, the measuring tape. Oh, here. The lady was lying on it. What are you going to do now? Mm, see how tall she was. She's rather jumbled about. Uh, and the, the feet, where are they? Oh, the thigh bone's all I need. Oh, hold it, please, huh? This one. Now, let's see. Let's see, uh... Yeah, 43 centimeters. Now, that's all right, sir. Now, 43 centimeters multiplied by 3.6. What are you doing? A sediment scale. You multiply the length of the thigh bone by 3.6. Man's is 3.7. And you get the exact height. Now, see, that's 154.8 centimeters. We'll call it 1 meter 55. Uh, meters 39.37 and... 3,500 of 39.37 is 21.65. Now, 39.37 plus 21.65, that's uh, 7, 5, 12, 6, 9, 10, 9, 10, 9, 3, 5, 6, 61.02 inches. There. Yeah. She was 5 feet 1 and 200 inches tall. In a word, 5 foot 1. What was her name? Whatever her name, sir, she was murdered. Consider that I've asked the question. Eh? Oh, 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 how do I know? Well, this bone here. Where does it fit? This is what she talked with. It's the voice box, the trachea, you know, her throat. Look, see these little wing things up here? Mm -hmm. Now, you see this one? See, it's broken. Well? well? This is one of the most significant fractures in all forensic medicine, sir. Why? There's only one way to do it. Oh, come on, man. Don't come Sherlock Holmes on me. How do you do it? Well, I was about to say by manual pressure on the throat, sir. Strangulation, you mean? Intentional strangulation, sir. There's no other way. And then there's the quicklime. <laughs> Surely you know that quicklime will not destroy a body, sir. Yes, I know it, Keith. But murderers seldom do. <laughs> Reference to the ARP records showed that every other casualty and missing persons in Kennington had been accounted for. It was apparent that the victim had not been a resident of that district. I caused bulletins and charts of the teeth to be sent to all the dentists in London for identification. No results were forthcoming, and we were forced to conclude that the dentist in question had become an air raid casualty, or that the work had been done in some other city. I gave Purcell a very difficult assignment. Difficult, sir? Well, it's not so difficult, but it's tedious. It'll take a long time. I know, but it's got to be done. I'm strongly of the opinion that it was murder. We checked carefully, sir, and the, the only quicklime on the entire premises was that in the vault with the skeleton. I thought they might have dusted the entire place with quicklime for sanitary purposes, but they hadn't. Certainly looks as if someone had wanted to dispose of a body. Until we know who she was, we'll never discover who he is. Ah, <sighs> yes, sir. Well, I'll get cracking. I'll need men to go over the missing persons rushes, sir, to find the names and addresses. Every woman five feet tall, of middle age with gray hair, who is still missing now. And then I'll need more men to make inquiries of all the next of kin to see which of them wore false teeth. And to find out which one wore an upper plate that matches the one in Briggs's chart here. Mm. It'll take a good many men and a good bit of time, sir. You can get the men, Purcell, and we've got the time. Good luck. Oh, Thank you, sir. Nothing whatever happened for two weeks except for the unrewarded activities of Purcell's men. I had a minor inspiration about the seventh day. Put me through to Sergeant Bowles, please. Commander Baird here, Sergeant. 
I should like you to send me all the file copies of the Metro operations for the period two weeks before to two weeks after the Easter Blitz of last year, please. Yes, at once, if you please. The Metropolitan Informations is a daily newspaper containing digests of all the crime news. It is usually invaluable. I pored over every issue, looking assiduously for an item that might prove of some help. I had reached the end of the first week after the date the Kennington Chapel was destroyed with no results whatever when Purcell reported. Found, sir. Oh, good. Here. Here is the missing plate. Oh, that's much better than I'd hoped for, Purcell. Apparently the plate hurt her mouth. She often left it at home. As a matter of fact, I found it at her sister's. Oh? I stopped upstairs to see Keith Briggs in the laboratory and they fit exactly, allowing for the fact that there's no flesh on the jawbones... Ah, here's Keith. Oh, is that right, Keith? Mm, that's right, sir. And the marks on the skeleton's teeth coincide exactly with these little clamps here. I've uh, brought the skull down. Yeah. You see, sir? Oh, she looks very fine. Congratulations, Purcell. Thank you, sir. The only thing is, uh, she was reported missing three days before the raid that destroyed the chapel. She was? It's in all the records, sir. Where were you, madame? Mm, she might have been hidden in the vault. Immediately she was murdered, sir. And then the fire, when the place was bombed... It must have been quite a hot fire. Let's see. The Kennington Fire Brigade, please. Yes. Oh, what's her name, Purcell? Mrs. Hope Russell. Russell. Hope Russell, did you say... Oh, hello. Is that the Kennington Fire Brigade? The senior company officer, if you please. I'll wait. Hope Russell... I've run across that name somewhere. Yes? Thank you. Hello, this is Commander Bird at Scotland Yard. Do you remember during the Easter Blitz last year when the Baptist Chapel was destroyed there in Kennington? What I wanted to know was that a very severe fire... What? There was no fire. Why? No fire, whatever, when the chapel was destroyed. Oh, two days later. Hmm, how very curious. It was reported by whom? The Kennington Police. Wasn't there a... Oh, look here, old chap. I'm sending at once for their divisional superintendent. Could you possibly come along with him to my office at the yard? Yes. I'm afraid it is rather important. I'll have him pick you up in his car. Thank you so much. At once, yes. No fire. Keith, would you mind? Get him in the fire chap over here at once. Use my name. Ask them both to bring their records for that night. Please. All right, sir. Oh, no fire, eh? What's that woman's name, Purcell? Mrs. Hope Russell. I knew I remembered it. Look at this. Metro Informations, eh? Look under articles lost and found. I was just reading it. <sighs> lost and found. Here, the, the third item. Read that. Found by postmistress Guilford Surrey in the post office yesterday, a woman's purse. Black leather, plain... Strap. Contents, lipstick, comb, mirror, two London tram tickets, 11th in coin, ration book, identity card, issued to Mrs. Hope Russell. Well, what was she doing in Guildford? Look at the date of the paper, Purcell. April? The... What was she doing in Guildford three days after the air raid in Kennington? <laughs> The divisional superintendent and the fire brigade officer from Kennington sat in my office with Purcell and me. I looked at the fire brigade records first. Now, here, sir, this is the day of the big raid when the chapel was destroyed. Good Friday evening, 11th of April, 1941. Yes. Every call is set down in the occurrence book here, sir. Yes, I know. Together with all the calls to the auxiliary fire service, the civilians, sir. Yes, I know. And you can see there's no report whatever of a fire at the Kennington Baptist Chapel from either source. Right. But over here, sir, on this page, Tuesday the 15th, four days later, 11 o'clock p.m. You see, sir? Mm -hmm. Chapel and so forth. Report telephoned in by Kennington Police Station. Do your records correspond, Superintendent? I'll read it to you, sir. 10.57 p.m. Tuesday, 15th of April. 
P.C. Allison telephoned to report a fire at the ruins of the Baptist Chapel. Alarm telephoned to Kennington Fire Brigade at 11 p.m. You're angry as a yourself, Robert. I did that indeed. Here's my initial. What do you think, Percival? Why did the police constable report it? Yes, I was just going to ask that. I don't understand, sir. Wasn't there a fire watcher? <laughs> Wasn't there? Well, sir, there, there was a fire watcher. <laughs> there was supposed to be. Well, where was he? Asleep, sir, probably. Or out catching a drink somewhere. Not an ARP man. No, sir. A private man employed by the wholesale chemists across the road from the chapel. A thoroughly useless man. Completely undependable. Yeah, his employers caught up with him at last, sir. He was sacked six or seven weeks ago. I've not seen him since. Neither have I. Well, sounds like a spiv to me. He is, sir. I knew him quite well. Had a great deal of trouble with his wife, and I used to see him quite regularly. Oh. He agreed to pay in 18 shillings and nine pence, I, I think it was, weekly, at the police station for her, which he didn't ever do. Oh, not ever. Never once till Easter Monday last year, right after the big raid. He kept it up, too, till he was discharged and left. I suppose this chemical firm he worked for could put us on to him. I'd like to have a chat with the fellow. Wouldn't you, Percival? I certainly would. I'll telephone them now and ask them if you'll give me the name of the firm and his name. Oh, his name is Stanley Russell. Russell? I wonder if you'd know his wife's name, Superintendent. I've seen it often enough. Yes, yes, sir. His name, uh, her name is uh, Mrs. Hope Russell. In the Pirates of Penzance, Gilbert and Sullivan complain bitterly that a policeman's lot is not a happy one. I subscribe most heartily to that sentiment. I would like you to hear Chief Inspector Purcell's report to me, just as he gave it, in my office. Well, Purcell, I said, did you find our Mr. Stanley Russell all right? Uh, not there. Well, you've left men to wait for him, haven't you? Sir, I got the address of the place. Sergeant Hatton and I drove there in a yard car driven by Constable oh, Small. Oh, get on with it, man. The whole bloody place was gone, sir. Gone? The whole bloody block was destroyed. Destroyed by an enemy bomb in an air raid six months ago. One day after Russell moved in. Not one person in the whole building's been heard of since. Oh, sir, I respectfully request permission to go somewhere and get howling drunk. You know, Purcell, I think I'll go with you. <laughs> But we didn't. We sat quietly in Commander Bird's office and thought long, dark thoughts. After a while, Keith Briggs, the pathologist, observing the light inside, stopped by, and almost at the same time, John Davidson from the Black Museum came in to see what was up. <laughs> Nothing's up, John, I said. On the contrary. What happened? Purcell was just telling Keith here. The chap is a blitz casualty. Did? And may God have mercy on his soul. Mm, I'd rather hope to hear a bloke in a black cap say that, Keith. I thought we had him, dead to rights. Oh, don't be so bloody American. I think we could have proved it. He strangled her, then hid her body in the vault, took a handbag to Guilford and lost it in the post office there. Cleverly putting Scotland Yard off the scent. Timing was a little bad. And then when the Blitz came... Tried quick lime first, didn't work. Blitz came... He set her afire. If, if he'd been a better fire watcher and not hiding in a hole somewhere, he'd have known there was no fire that night. Oh, but he wasn't a good fire watcher. He wasn't good at anything. I wonder. I wonder uh, what, John? What do you mean, John? Well, <clears throat> if I'd strangled my wife and burned her up, which God forbid, because I haven't one, <laughs> I'd be very happy to have people think I was dead. Well, if I'd hear that my home was destroyed and everybody in it dead, I should be delighted, most delighted. I'd change my name. Not in wartime, you no, wouldn't. No, that's not. right. Identity cards, ration books. Absolutely. I'd forgotten. Getting new ones in the name of Harry Hawkins or Sam Small <laughs> no, would be no, difficult. No, <laughs> but even Scotland Yard would stop looking for me if they thought I was dead. Wouldn't they, Commander Bird? And you'd go around buying new clothing and whatnot. If you could, and presenting your own ration book in your own name and... 
Where are you going, Purcell? I'm going to stagger home through the blackout, sir, with your permission. I have a large number of men's clothing stores to interview beginning tomorrow. And I'd like to get a good night's sleep. Good night, all. The Stanley Russell crop was enormous. Chief Inspector Purcell discovered that 200... Let me see. 234 of them had purchased clothing since the date our Stanley Russell had been reported dead by enemy action. But not one of them was the Stanley Russell we wanted. We made thorough inquiries of all his known acquaintances, all to no avail. The war office had no record of our man. We were reluctantly forced to the conclusion that he was dead, or that he had heard of our search for him and gone to ground most effectively, as I said to a rather haggard Purcell. Purcell shook his head. Ah, I'd like to keep on looking, sir, if I may. I have a hunch that he'll turn up unexpectedly. It will certainly be unexpected so far as I'm concerned. I'd like to keep on trying, sir. Well, for a few weeks more, but I'm afraid... Commander Bird speaking. Yes, he's here. It's for you, Purcell. Well, I'll I'll take it outside, sir. No, don't. Take it here. Thank you, sir. Chief Inspector Purcell here. Who is he? Oh? Well, I, I, I don't know him personally, but I know of him. Yes. Will you ask him to wait a moment? I'll ring you back. Sir. Eh? I've never been so shocked in all my life. Oh, really? What's happened? Somebody dead? Somebody's alive. What? If I'd heard this on the radio, I wouldn't have believed it. Why, well, what's happened? Mr. Stanley Russell is calling on us. <laughs> well, Brother Purcell... Let him enter and be received in due form. (laughs) Will you show Mr. Stanley Russell in, please? Thank you. (laughs) You sound like a spider, Purcell. Thank you, sir. I feel I am. And a chair for our guest. (laughs) You think I sound like a spider? Come in. Mr. Stanley Russell, sir. Good morning, gentlemen. I was looking for Inspector Purcell. Come in, sir. I'm Chief Inspector Purcell. How do you do, sir? This is Commander Bird. Good morning. Good morning, sir. May I sit down? Thank you. Does one smoke in here? Yes, by all means. Will you... Will you try an Abdullah? Ta, I'm afraid I always smoke Woodbines. (sighs) Now... I hear Scotland Yard is looking for me. That's uh, <clears throat> that's true. Why, may I ask? You've been extremely hard to find. Oh, I've been in the country. Derbyshire. We should have come there eventually. Oh, I've saved you the trouble. What do you want to see me about? You were a fire watcher, Mr. Russell, in Kennington. Yes. There was an unreported fire at the Baptist Chapel there whilst you were on duty. When? Two nights after the raid that destroyed the chapel. I didn't see any fire. Is that all you wanted? No, Mr. Russell. Well, I don't recall any fire, sir. You didn't see or hear the fire brigade? No, sir. Near 11 o'clock? Oh. (laughs) Well, (laughs) I must admit I wasn't there. Where were you? I did see the fire brigade moving away when I came back, but... Where were you? Oh, I was out of cigarettes, and I strolled around the corner to see if I could borrow one or two from the fire watcher at post four. He says he never saw you, Mr. Russell. Oh, he's probably forgotten. It's a long time ago. He will swear he didn't see you that night. Well, (laughs) the fire obviously didn't do any damage. A woman was burned to death in it. Murdered? Do you know anything about her? Of course not. I'm very sorry to hear that anything like that... The woman was your wife. May I have one of your cigarettes, please? Thanks. So that's what became of her. Do you know anything about it? I'm afraid I must disappoint you, gentlemen. 
I wasn't on very good terms with her. We know that. I'm afraid I've no tears for her. She was... Oh, well, she's dead. No, I shan't say anything. Naturally, I'm shocked, Naturally. but I'm afraid I'm not sorry. Do you know anyone who would have had a motive for murdering her? <laughs> you had a motive, didn't you, Mr. Russell? <laughs> I can see how you might think so, but I didn't murder her, I assure you. When did you last see her? I don't really remember. Several months before she was murdered, I think. How do you know she was murdered? Why, well, you said so. Did I? Oh, I would have had good cause to, Inspector, but I'd have been a fool to do it now, wouldn't I? Yes. Well, Mr. Russell, thank you for coming to see us. If there is anything else you remember, please come back and see us again. I think that's all for now. How can we find you if we need you? We may want your corroboration of certain facts. Well, I'll write down my address, sir. It's a sad affair, and you have our sympathy. Thank you, sir. I admit I'm terribly shocked. Of course. Well, here's the address and telephone number, sir. Thank you. Feel free to call on us at any time. Goodbye. Well, good goodbye, gentlemen. I was merely trying to do my duty. Oh, you've done it admirably, sir. Goodbye. Well, thank you. Well, he's a liar. I know it. May I ask why you... Why I let him go? <laughs> he thinks he's got us completely fooled. He'll be back with more helpful information. Come in, Mr. Russell. Uh, I, I just oh, remembered dear. something that might be of importance. Uh, come in. I remembered that an old straw pelleus, uh, a mattress I used to catch 40 winks on... It was stolen about that time. Mm -hmm. Could that have been used to start the fire? Did you find it? Yes, we found it. Oh, that's good. Well, I, I must go now. Oh, by the way, was the body destroyed? By the quicklime? Yes. What's the matter? You are a very clever man, Mr. Russell. Much too clever for your own good. Why? Why, may I ask? No one had mentioned quicklime except you. Well, I thought... I mean... I, I didn't... I wasn't even there. I, I tell you, I didn't touch her. I said you were much too clever for your own good. You... You think I... I didn't strangle her. Go ahead, Chief Inspector. Stand no. Stanley Russell, I arrest you on the charge of willful no, murder. I didn't do it. And I, I warn you that whatever no, you no, say will be taken no, down in writing no. and may be given in evidence. The crime. The painstaking evidence Scotland Yard had collected, together with Stanley Russell's own statements, were sufficient to convince a jury that he had murdered his wife, Hope Russell, and burned her body. All his allegations of misconduct on her part were proved completely false. It was demonstrated at the trial that he had planned the murder for a long time, and having found a convenient time and place, had committed it. The verdict. My lord, we, the jury, find the defendant guilty of willful murder. The sentence. Prisoner at the bar. Stand up. It is the sentence of this court that you be hanged by the neck until dead. And may God have mercy on your soul. You have heard the true story of case number 397MR381 from the files of Scotland Yard. The names of the participants have, for obvious reasons, been changed. Starting next week, Whitehall 1212 will be heard at a new time, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Research by Percy Hoskins of the London Daily Express, stories for radio written and directed by Willis Cooper. Next, listen for Tales of the Texas Rangers on NBC.